if you have kids, um, or if you remember, um, say, the, when your uh, niece or nephew was to be born, or some relative of yours, or a friend was to be born, um, you may remember back to that first time you felt the child kick. Um, now, I, I remember this. You know, it's always, it's always such a huge moment where, where you're, you feel that little one move for the very first time. And they've been moving for a long time before you feel it, right? They're squirming around in there. But it's always kind of this big moment where you feel it. And I'll, I'll tell you a little story here. I remember the first time that we felt our first child move. Um, my, my wife was going to go get some of her relatives from the airport. We were living in Boston, and I cooked up this, like, Peruvian dish, and I followed it to the letter. So I, like, put in all the hot peppers, and, and like, I just did that, like, you know. She, she afterwards is like, you know, maybe you can kind of reduce some of those sometimes. I, I just put them all in, right? And so they came home, and everybody sat down to this meal that I had ready for them, and they started eating it, and it was, it was like, kind of, you know, it made your eyes water a little bit. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we've got this little guy in there moving around saying, whoa, what have you fed me? What's going on, right? That was the first time we felt him kick. And, you know, here, here's a story of a moment where uh, uh, Elizabeth feels little John leaping in the womb. It was that womb. Maybe the very first time is that moment where she felt him kicking and leaping. And it was a response to Mary, pregnant with Jesus, coming to visit her. And, you know, we're in this series right now called uh, What a Beautiful Name. And we're looking at four names of Jesus that are given in the Gospels, and especially around his birth. Because during Advent, we are celebrating the coming of Christ in the, in the past, into our lives now, his coming in the future. We're looking at those names, these beautiful names. And today we're looking at the name, My Lord. Because Elizabeth, Elizabeth says to Mary, Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come and visit me? And it's in that moment where she's filled with the Holy Spirit, and John leaps in her womb. And today, we're, I, what I want us to hear in this passage is that when God, our Lord, comes to us, we are called to respond with joy and with belief. And, and once again, like today, I'm going to preach through this passage, and we're going to look at it, but um, if you want to go deeper, on Wednesday evening, we're doing a discussion group that Ellen is leading, and you can come and check that out. It'll be a chance to kind of talk about the sermon, talk about the passage a little bit. But let me frame it up. We're, we're looking at Luke chapter 1, and what we've got here is a story of a miraculous birth, right? We all know the story of the miraculous birth of Jesus, but it's actually two miraculous births. Um, there is Mary, um, who, is, who is expecting Jesus, though she is not yet married, though she is still a virgin. And there is Elizabeth, who is her relative. And Elizabeth, if you have read this and you remember this, Elizabeth was older. Um, they did not have children, she and her husband Zechariah. And in their old age, they were promised a child. And suddenly there she is, she's expecting a child. And that's going to be John the Baptist. And we're, we read in verse 39, At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. It actually should say to the hill country of Judah. And I'll come back to that. Now that's about 90 miles from where uh, um, Mary is living in, Bethle in, in Nazareth to, to go to the hill country of Judah. We don't know who all went with Mary. You could probably assume she at least had some friends or relatives that went with her. Maybe Joseph went with her, but we're not told that here. But the scene that's important is when she arrives, right? The journey was uneventful, but it's the arrival that counts. When she shows up, she enters Zechariah's home, is greeted by Elizabeth. In verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? The leaping and the filling, this is important. And she says, verse 42, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you were bare. Why am I so favored that the mother of, there it is, my Lord should come to me? Um, that baby leaped in the womb as soon as he heard your voice, or I heard your voice. And verse 45, blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And, and you know, this is, this is really important. This, this, this passage right here, my Lord, where, where Elizabeth speaks of Jesus as my Lord, right? It's a prophetic passage. Um, it's, it's a passage that's infused with all of these hopes for the future because the prophets had been predicting the coming of the Christ, of the Messiah for so long, of the one who is going to set Israel free, the one who's going to transform 
the world, my Lord. Um, and Elizabeth uses that word, and it's kind of striking when she calls the infant Jesus my Lord, because up until this point in the Gospel of Luke, and you've only got, you know, 40-some verses, but up until this point, the word Lord, that name, that title, it has only been used to speak of God. And here is Mary calling Jesus my Lord. Now what she's doing when she taps into that language is going all the way back into the Old Testament and using the language of Lord. Now you don't, we use, we talk about Lord, it's kind of a churchy word, it's kind of a biblical word. We don't really use it in many other contexts. It's one of those words that like we kind of just use here in church and maybe we're a nerd to it. Like we don't even notice how unique that word is because you don't really go around calling people like Lord or using that in in, in common conversation. But it is this really, it's this really key word, this pivotal word in the scriptures. So in the Old Testament, God gives his name to the people of Israel and his name is it is so sacred, right, like the second commandment, that you don't use the name of the Lord in vain. It's so sacred to the people of Israel that they avoided saying it. Uh, you know, he, uh, Moses, when he meets God at that burning bush, he says, who should I tell the sons of Israel has sent me? God says, um, tell them I am who I am. And that's like the first time God gives his name. It's this word that's related to I am. Usually it is pronounced Yahweh. But the ancient Israelites, it was so sacred, they didn't say it. And so when they saw that name, instead of saying it, um, they would just pronounce the word for the Lord. Um, and so that really became that idea of the Lord. Um, it's God as king, God as ruler. Um, so in that sense, it is something that is very reverential. It's God above who rules from heaven. But it's also a stand-in for the personal name of God that was given to God's covenant people, this people that God has a distinct relationship with. He's not just the Lord of the universe. He's always also this, this God who comes into history, breaks into human life, and is there personally. He has a name, right? He's not God just kind of out there somewhere. He is God who has a name. He is the Lord. And so it's both reverential and personal. And that's important because then in the New Testament, that word for the Lord gets used to speak of Jesus. And Paul in particular loves to say the Lord Jesus Christ. So exam for example, Paul writes and he says in, sec in, in Philippians chapter 2, and he says that, that the Lord Jesus um, was in the very image of God and, the, and had, the, had the character of God, had the nature of God, but not, did not regard it as something to be grasped. And instead, he took the form of a servant, and he was given the name above all names. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. And that name that he's given is the Lord. Because he says so that every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth, um, and, at the, and will pronounce him the Lord Jesus Christ. Or Paul writes in Romans um, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. He says, if you uh, confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your hearts that you, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? So salvation hinges on that name. Uh, um, or you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says that no one can say um, uh, the, that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, which is to say that is this act of power, this act of reverence, it's, it requires something kind of supernatural to really not just say it, but to believe it. That Jesus is Lord. So all of that meaning from the Old Testament all the way back to Moses when God gives his name to the people of Israel, all of the Psalms, all of the ways that God is reverenced as the Lord, that comes into a focus in Jesus. And here's Elizabeth. Here, here's Elizabeth doing this in the gospel. Maybe the first person, and she doesn't just say the Lord, but she says, my Lord, right? It's deeply personal. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's this, it's spoken with, with reverence and with love, and it, it causes her this deep, deep joy. I mean, here is God, the ruler of the universe, and also the one who comes into the, this family, of a lowly family, and is born um, as a, a, a baby. Now, you know, sometimes we get that with names, right? Like where people have a very important status, like they're sort of VIPs, but then they, they don't let that on. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you meet somebody 
and they don't tell you their title, they just tell you your name, and then you kind of realize afterwards, like, oh, wow, that was, that was so-and-so, he was a pretty nice guy. I remember one time um, at our little church that we attended in Boston, I um, met this older individual, this older gentleman, and, he, and I'm like, hi, I'm Brad, and he says, well, I'm Joe. Oh, well, okay, good, good to meet you, Joe. Well, it turns out that Joe was the president of the medical school, right? And, you know, this renowned doctor and really well-known, but just, he's just Joe. That's, I, I knew him as Joe for the longest time until finally someone's like, you know who that is, right? And, uh, but, you know, sometimes people do that, and here, here's, here's God, both got this powerful name, this reverential name, this name that speaks to all who he is of glory, and also he is just, he's my Lord. He's coming in here personally and, and with, with intimacy and with love, he's coming into the, the arms of Mary and to this family. And, and Elizabeth is the one that recognizes that. And she responds with, with joy and with belief. But you know, it's really interesting. We should kind of look at this just a little bit. You know, Mary showing up and Elizabeth responding with that joy and with belief. Luke is making kind of a point here that's really, really subtle. In the Old Testament, the, the presence of God was focused on the Ark of the Covenant. You know, if you remember what that is, we're not talking about the Ark that Noah built, not this big boat, the Ark of the Covenant. It's this box carried on poles, covered in gold. Um, it's got some special things inside of it, the, the, the stones of the Ten Commandments, and a jar of manna, right, that they ate in the wilderness, and Aaron, the priest, rod that budded, right, these signs of God's miraculous saving power, the Ark of the Covenant, where when they marched out into the battle, they, they took it with them. When they lost it, they were despondent. When they built the temple, they moved the Ark in. The Ark of the Covenant, that's where God's presence is focused. And, and if you compare, get this, if you compare 2 Samuel chapter 6, now that's the chapter where David goes and moves the ark from where it had been, moves the ark, and it stays at the house of a guy named Obed-Edom, moves it there, and then eventually moves it to Jerusalem, to the new temple, to, well, to get ready for the new temple. He doesn't build it yet. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, David makes that journey with the ark. If you compare that with the words that Luke uses here to describe Mary in, in Luke chapter 1, you're going to see some resemblance. Um, so 2 Samuel chapter 6, David, it says David arose and he went to Judah. It's actually Baal Judah um, to get the ark. This is why it's important that it's not Judea. Luke actually uses a different word, not Judea. He uses Judah because Mary also arose and went to Judah, right? The ark and Mary. And David, if you remember this story, they're bringing the ark in, right? They're carrying it forward. What's David do? He dances and leaps before the ark. And here, as Mary appears before Elizabeth, John the Baptist leaps in her womb, right? David, 2 Samuel 6, says, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? And Elizabeth asks, Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Um, the Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom. This person, it's kind of a way station. It stays in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. Mary remained in the house of Elizabeth for how long? Three months. So you get these little clues, right? Luke uses language here very, very precisely. He's kind of saying Mary is like the Ark of the Covenant. She's carrying that which is most sacred and precious. She is actually carrying the very presence of our Lord here on earth. And she's like sort of this living, breathing Ark of the Covenant. And when that Ark, when that mother of the Lord Jesus Christ shows up, Elizabeth is filled with joy, right? She's filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit brings joy. We know from Romans 14, 17, it says that this, the, the kingdom of God is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, right? So joy, wherever the Holy Spirit shows up, there is joy. She says, why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And little John we leaps in the, in the womb, right? So this is the first thing we got to notice. Like her response is joy. John's response is joy. There's just so much joy. It's just saturated with joy. The coming of Jesus brings joy. I mean, nobody had to tell little John to jump 
and rejoice. Nobody had to feed Elizabeth some spicy food to get him going, right? He just was sensitive to the presence of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus. He experienced, even as just a tiny little infant, joy. And so I think about that during Advent. Have you experienced this kind of joy at the presence of the Lord? Right? In your life, but maybe especially right now as we're thinking about uh, his coming again, his coming into our lives right now, have you experienced that kind of joy? You know, it, it's like it's, we worship, right? But do we, do we worship just pouring our hearts out? Do we rejoice before God? Do we, do we let ourselves be joyful, right? Do we experience happiness at God's presence, right? Do we have that kind of joy like Elizabeth and little John and especially during Advent, what are the moments where we experience that joy? You know, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes, like, I, I, I can never really figure this out, but I think sometimes there are these moments of joy. Or I, have you experienced this where you just, like, get seized by joy? Where it seems like God just kind of enters into your life, and you have no reason to be joyful. Sometimes it's counterfactual. You feel like, I kind of upset about something or worried about something or whatever. You know, the kid's sick or we've just got life going on. You know, but suddenly you feel joy. You know, I, I don't know how we open ourselves up to that, but I think it is what God's promising for us, this, this joy in the Holy Spirit, this joy at the coming of Jesus. And especially during Advent, I think it's a, it's a time to be sensitized again to that joy, the joy that he has for us. You know, it's a season of joy. Right? I think, I think we ought to experience some joy. I think the Christian life is meant to, to be joyful, right? I mean, it's taking up our cross. It's hard. It's challenging. But it is joyful. I think to know and follow Jesus is joyful. And, and you know, I, I don't—this this comes from the very character of God, right? Because God is—loves what he has made. God is a God of joy. God is a God who rejoices in even the smallest details of, of the world that he has created. And the kingdom of God is a kingdom of joy. And so wherever you're at, you know, whatever you're kind of feeling, you, know, you can't force joy, right? It's not like slapping a smile on your face even when you feel crummy. That's not what joy is. Joy comes from within. Wherever you're at, you know, I think just hear that invitation to joy. Right? Hear that invitation to be open to God's joy at the coming of Jesus. And don't try to make anything happen in your life, but just invite Jesus in and focus on him during the season. Ask that, that he'll give you that joy and just see what happens. Now the other thing that Elizabeth experiences here, and that I think points to what all of us are called to experience during this season of Advent as we really focus on the coming of our Lord. I think the other thing that she experiences is belief, right? And joy and belief are tied together. We lit the candle of faith today. Faith and belief, you know, they're, they're in some ways synonyms. Um, but she focuses on that belief, and it's Mar Mary's belief too, right? Look at verse 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the, what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Um, you know, I think about that a little bit. That would be one of those, like, great lines to paint on one of those wooden signs, right? Like, blessed is she who has believed, right? Or, um, you know, I, I think about, like, what, what are kind of, like, great, great uh, mottos to have. Blessed is she who has believed, right? Put that above your computer. Put that on the, on the mirror. Blessed is she who has believed. Or blessed is the one who has believed. Uh, and you know, this is a season of belief too, right? We're believing something about the Lord who comes into history. A and it can be challenging in our moment because, well, you know, honestly, people see belief as something either kind of like ridiculous or maybe scary, Right? Ridiculous in that if you believe certain things that, like, Mary really was a virgin, that God really did come through Jesus, that, that these events that we read about in the gospel, they really happened, all the, the miracles. If you believe that stuff, people will kind of scoff at you sometimes. Or scary because it's like, okay, are you one of those people, right? Like, kind of a wingnut, like a true believer, right? Like, are, what are you going to—what else might you believe about the world? But it's a season of belief. Right? Do we believe? Do we invest our faith 
in this Jesus, my Lord, who is born of Mary, do, do we have that kind of confidence? It's like Paul said in Romans 1.16, um, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, right? Do we, do we uh, place our confidence and not have that, any kind of shame in the gospel? Do we believe? And you'll see, like, signs, right, that say, like, believe, right, during the Christmas season. And I don't always know what they're calling us to believe in. I guess that, like, Santa really is going to come down the chimney and bring gifts and that ain't reindeer really fly, or I don't know, just kind of generalized belief in the magic of Christmas. But do we believe these concrete elements of the gospel, what the gospel teaches us here. You know, um, the joy and the belief are connected because right here we see Mary or Elizabeth say, uh, blessed is she who believed. And that belief, that blessed, that word for blessed, turns out this is the very first beatitude in the Gospels, right? Jesus teaches the Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6, where he says, blessed are the poor, uh, blessed are the hungry, and so on. Or he teaches them in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, um, and so on and so forth. That word blessed is a different word than the one that's used a little bit earlier here. It's makarios. That means happy. So happy is the one who believed. And here is the very first one. Happy is she who believed, right? The one who entrusts themselves to, to God, the one who um, is, believes that God truly knows us best and that God truly desires the best for our, our lives. Happy is the one who believes. And here's Mary, the first one who is really beginning to believe that because Mary's willingness to say yes to God was that incredible statement of belief. That's what opened up the door for so many other things in her life and for salvation history. She said yes to God, and she became the mother of who Elizabeth calls my Lord. I mean, that's, exam that's Mary's example. I mean, that's what we ought to look to for Mary, right? This belief. She entrusts herself to God. Uh, she, she knows she's going to be in a hard situation, that nobody's going to really believe her, that maybe Joseph's not going to want to stick with her, but she believes. And uh, and she, she goes and sets out to Elizabeth, even though Elizabeth could have said, like, what, wait a minute, what's going on with you? But, but she believed, and, and Elizabeth believed, and so many people believed, and Joseph believed, and the shepherds believed, and we see the, 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 the magi believe, and people believe that this little one really is the Lord of the universe, my Lord, born among humankind. And Mary's the first one in that whole chain. She believed. So how'd she do that? How did Mary have that kind, of, that kind of courage to really be able to pull it off? I mean, I mean, I think that's part of what makes Mary so special, right? She believed at the beginning what would seem impossible, that this infant Jesus within her would change the world, would save it. I mean, what hope she had, what faith, what daring belief. And, you know, we might think, well, you know, She's got like an angel showing up to her and speaking to her, so that's got to be a little bit easier to, to believe than it is for people who are standing at such a remove. But, but I don't know. Right? I don't know if it was any easier for Mary because Mary believed, and then suddenly she's in this kind of awkward situation, and when the baby Jesus is, is born, she believes. But Herod, the king, tries to kill him, right? Lord, is this what's supposed to happen? And then she believes, but... She's got to go to Egypt with her husband and her newborn son. Then she comes back, all this moving around, all this disruption. disruption. Then 30 years of silence in Nazareth, this child growing up in her home. We don't really hear anything from him except for that one little vignette when they go to the temple in Jerusalem. Other than that, silence. And then he goes out onto the world stage, 30 years of ministry. And yes, it's healing. And yes, it's teaching. And yes, it's casting out demons with power, but then he's crucified. Lord, this? But yet Mary believed. I mean, he was, he was raised, but even then it seemed like such a small group of people that believed that message and that saw what was happening. They were quickly persecuted. Lord, is this supposed to happen? But Mary believed. And you know, the, here, here's Mary staking her belief on something that could have seemed so fragile, but yet was so powerful. 
And, and I think Advent is a time to borrow a page from Mary's book, right? Dust off our beliefs. Think about what you really believe. Do you hold it tightly? Are you willing maybe even to defend it? Are you, are you ashamed of the gospel? Do you believe? You know, the history of the church is really a history of people staking their faith on their beliefs, right? Believing in the gospels, that's still, we, still what we see today. I mean, especially in places like Iran or China or Somalia. I mean, all around the world to believe, to really believe and be willing to confess that when you're backed into a corner. You know, that's going to get you more than just a funny look. That can get you arrested and tortured and potentially killed. It gets you in hot water. And here we are with this privilege of believing freely, do we? You know, verse 45, take this as a key verse. Blessed is she, shake it up. Blessed is he, right? Blessed is the one. Blessed is anyone who believes what the Lord has said will be accomplished, right? Blessed is the one who believes. You know, we sing about Advent as a season of comfort and joy. But I think we could really sing with Elizabeth and we could sing about a time of belief and joy, right? Of investing our lives, staking our lives on him, and finding the joy that he offers to, to all who come to him. During this season, may God strengthen your faith in Jesus and give you great joy as we celebrate his coming.